and dearly beloved in the hearts of Jesus and Mary. The feast of St. Stephen, the first martyr for the holy Catholic faith, has been celebrated by the Church on December the 26th, the day after Christmas, from the earliest centuries. Because of its closeness to one of the greatest solemnities of the Church here, that is, in the Nativity of the Lord, the Feast of St. Stephen might seem to be lost in the shadows of the majesty of Christ the Lord and to be pushed into the background. Yet the fact is that St. Stephen stands out all the more brightly with his feast coming on the day after Christmas, since the glory of the Lord, which shone upon the shepherds of Bethlehem, shines also upon him on his feast day. And this is precisely how St. Fulgentius, one of the fathers of the early church, looked upon St. Stephen in his feast. That is, he looked upon the first martyr in comparison with our Lord, whose nativity is celebrated the day before. St. Fulgentius, a bishop of the 6th century, preached a sermon on the feast of St. Stephen, and in that sermon he presented a whole list of comparisons between the newborn Savior and St. Stephen. The Church still uses that sermon of St. Fulgentius in her sacred liturgy, that is, in the divine office, which is the official prayer of priests and religious. Before we consider St. Stephen as a favorite of Our Lady, which is our main theme, let us listen to St. Fulgentius as he sets the feasts of Christmas and of St. Stephen side by side and notes the comparisons between the newborn king and his faithful soldier, St. Stephen. Yesterday, St. Fulgentius begins, we celebrated the temporal birth of our eternal King. Today we celebrate the triumphant suffering of his soldier. Yesterday our King, coming forth from the virginal womb, did deign to visit the world while clothed in mortal flesh. Today his soldier, going forth uh, from the tabernacle of his body, has entered heaven as a victor. The soldier has ascended into heaven after being stoned by the Jews, whereas the king descended from heaven amidst the rejoicing of angels. Yesterday the exultant angels sang glory to God in the highest. Today they have joyously received Stephen into their midst. Yesterday Christ was wrapped in swaddling clothes for our saint. Today Stephen has been clothed with a robe of immortality. Yesterday, the smallness of the manger held the infant Christ. Today, the immensity of heaven has received the victorious Stephen. Thus, we can see the glory of St. Stephen better in the brilliant light of glory of the Word made flesh. But now we must see how Mary, the mother of the newborn Savior, contributed to the glory of St. Stephen. Our scriptural knowledge of St. Stephen and of his martyrdom comes from the Acts of the Apostles, written by St. Luke, the writer of the third gospel. But though St. Luke is known as the evangelist of Mary, he says nothing about the very special love which Our Lady had for the first martyr of the faith, which was established among men by her divine Son. This is understandable from the simple fact that Jesus Christ is the center of attraction in the Scriptures, and that the Holy Spirit of God inspired and guided the sacred writers to concentrate on Him, who is the sole Savior of mankind. The full glorification of the Savior's mother was reserved by God for later times, after the faith would be solidly established in the Church. Aside from this, we are not at all surprised that the humble handmaid of the Lord desired that her name should not be mentioned in the Gospels and elsewhere in the New Testament except where absolutely necessary. We know this from the mystical city of God, which is also the source 
which the Most High hath provided for our knowledge of Our Lady's special love for St. Stephen, and, on the other hand, of the saint's devoted attachment to her. We rely on the mystical city of God so much because so many popes have approved of it and have recommended it, and in 1929 Pope Pius XI gave his apostolic benediction to all readers and promoters of that great four-volume work. Another thing that should not surprise us is the fact that Our Lady had this very special love for St. Stephen and that she bestowed upon him and obtained for him from God special favors not granted to just any one of the faithful. All we need to do is remember that God himself has a special love for those who love him more than others do, and he bestows special favors upon such persons. All the great graces given to the Blessed Virgin were due, first of all, to the fact that she was chosen as the mother of the Son of God, but also to the fact that she loved God so much and responded perfectly to His graces and fulfilled His most holy will more perfectly than anyone else. God is extremely lavish in love and grace and favor towards those who love Him with all their hearts and souls. The saints are outstanding examples of this fact, and they are our models to imitate in this regard. So we need not be surprised if the Mother of God is like God Himself in her love for those who love her and who love God wholeheartedly. But it is necessary to point out, as the author of the mystical city of God makes it clear, that the Blessed Mother, while still living on earth, was most careful not to show any favoritism in public or in situations that could arouse jealousy or resentment or hard feelings among the faithful. In public, or, um, or when among large or small groups of the first Christians, she manifested her great maternal love and solicitude towards all, and she bestowed favors and graces upon all according to the merits of each one, giving no more and no less than each one deserved. She practiced perfect charity as well as perfect justice and fairness toward all. St. Stephen, who merited the greater love of the Queen of Heaven, was one of the seventy-two disciples appointed by our Lord, and his zeal in following the Divine Master and in imitating him was outstanding. The saint immediately caught the attention of the Mother of the Lord and she looked upon him with an especial love, and she placed him among the first in her esteem. We must mention that Our Lady did not know of the great virtue of St. Stephen only by observing him, but she knew far more than the human eye can notice by its own natural powers. Her divine Son revealed her the virtue and the merits of all the faithful of the early church. She knew the condition of the soul of each one and the graces that each one received and how he cooperated with grace. She knew the beginning and the final end of each one. The Divine Savior bestowed this superhuman and supernatural knowledge upon her because her position as the mother and teacher of the church required it. Thus the Blessed Virgin knew by special revelation that the, what the Divine Master had in store for St. Stephen. <coughs> she knew that the Lord had chosen St. Stephen as a special defender of his honor and of his holy name before the unbelieving Jews, and she knew that the saint was destined to give his life for the Divine Master. Because of this, her immaculate heart was filled with the most tender affection for this great saint. While the Holy Mother saw the great courage that would bring the crown of martyrdom to the saint, she also saw that he was, despite his vigorous defense of the Divine Master's honor and his strong condemnation of the incredulity of the Jews, 
of a sweet and peaceful disposition. The Immaculate Mother loved him for this with all her heart because she saw in him an image of her Divine Son. In fact, whenever the Holy Virgin saw anyone of a naturally meek and peaceful character, she had the habit of saying that such a person resembled her Divine Son. St. Stephen, because of his heroic virtues, merited not only a very special love, but also many special graces and favors from the Blessed Mother. And Our Lady also thanked the Lord for having created and for having chosen such a saint for the first fruits of his martyrs. Then Stephen responded gratefully and faithfully to the great favors conferred upon him by the Lord and by his Most Holy Mother. He had the highest regard for the Mother of the Lord, and because he knew that she was appointed by her Divine Son to be the Mother and Teacher of the early Church, he frequently sought her counsel and asked for enlightenment in many of the mysteries of God. Our Lady graciously answered all his questions in accord with the wisdom which God had given her. But she also encouraged him and exhorted him to work zealously for the honor of Christ the Lord. And it was permitted by God that she be the one who forewarned him of his coming martyrdom. One day the Blessed Mother said to the saint, Stephen, thou shalt be the firstborn of the martyrs, engendered by my divine Son and Lord, by the example of his death. Thou shalt follow his footsteps like a privileged disciple his master, and like a courageous soldier his captain. And at the head of the army of martyrs thou shalt carry his banner of the cross. Hence it is proper that thou arm thyself with fortitude under the shield of faith, and be assured that the power of the Most High shall be with thee in the conflict. These words of the Holy Mother had the effect of inflaming the heart of St. Stephen with an intense desire for martyrdom. Because of this burning desire to attain the crown of martyrdom, of which he had been assured by Our Lady, the saint fearlessly offered himself to engage in disputes with the rabbis and other teachers of the law of Moses. Aside from St. Peter and St. John, both apostles, no one else among the apostles and disciples except St. Stephen dared to dispute openly with the Jews on matters pertaining to the law and to the true faith of Jesus Christ. His eagerness to defend the honor of Christ the Lord knew no bounds, now that he knew he would lay down his life for the Divine Master. He acted as if he were afraid that someone else might win the first crown of martyrdom ahead of him. As is recorded in the Acts of the Apostles by St. Luke, St. Stephen was a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and also he was full of grace and power, and that is why he was so well equipped by God to withstand the errors of the unbelieving Jewish leaders and to refute them and uh, to accuse the Jews of refusing to believe in Christ the Lord, the promised Redeemer, for whom they were claiming to be waiting to come into the world. St. Luke also mentions that St. Stephen worked great wonders and signs among the people. All this served to attract the attention of the Jews towards him, who would be the first victim of their hatred after Christ's death upon the cross. But St. Luke does not mention what we would take for granted, and that is the insidious scheming and activity of Satan working invisibly among the wicked Jewish leaders. The Prince of Darkness gradually learned of the ambitions of St. Stephen for martyrdom, and he realized what glory and honor this would bring, not only upon the saint himself, but especially upon Christ the Lord 
and upon a new faith. For that reason, Satan strove with all his power to prevent the public martyrdom of St. Stephen in testimony of the true faith of Jesus Christ. He did not want the saint to win the glorious crown of martyrdom. And with this idea, we are quite familiar in our own times, because we know, for example, how the communists, the instruments of the same prince of darkness, have deliberately refrained from putting to death many of the followers of Christ, so that they might not be honored as martyrs among men. And they have chosen rather to torture them only, and to make life miserable for them in whatever way they could, physically or mentally, not realizing that their blind hatred, that in their blind hatred they are only assuring a martyr's reward for those whom they torture or mistreat in any way because of the true faith. Lucifer failed in those kind of tactics in regard to St. Stephen. He tried to do away with the saints secretly so that there might be no evidence of martyrdom. It was not difficult for him to persuade the hate-filled Jews to seek his murder in secret, and this was attempted many times during the months that followed the descent of the Holy Ghost upon the apostles and disciples. But neither Satan nor the Jews counted on the saint being specially protected by the Mother of God, who knew by special divine enlightenment all about their malicious designs. The Holy Mother protected St. Stephen from all their attacks, until the time decreed by the Most High for his martyrdom should arrive. Three times she had one of her angels lead the saint away from a certain house in which his enemies had set up plans to strangle him to death. The angel was seen by the saint, though he was not visible to the would-be murderers, and this angel actually carried the saint to the cynical into the presence of Our Lady. At other times, this uh, same angel, at the command of the Heavenly Queen, would warn St. Stephen not to go along a certain street, or not to go to this or that house, because his enemies were waiting to ambush him. And sometimes, the Blessed Mother would detain St. Stephen in the cynical because she knew that his enemies were waiting for him to come out. The extremely anxious enemies of the saint would even surround the cynical, watching all exits in the hope of murdering him as he went to his own dwelling place. And they did this also at other houses where they knew the saint happened to be. But Our Lady delivered him always from all dangers, as we ourselves in the Memorare pray that she might deliver us also. St. Stephen gave no thought to the dangers awaiting him, and in fact welcomed them as he went about his duties of bringing spiritual help and consolation to the faithful. Our Lady did not for many months tell him how much time he had left before his martyrdom. The saint saw how he was rescued from his enemies by the Blessed Mother time after time, and he would at times lovingly complain to her, saying to her, My Lady and my protectors, when shall the day arrive in which I shall pay to my God and to my Master the debt of my life? by sacrificing it for the honor and glory of His holy name. Our Lady was pleased with St. Stephen's loving complaints because they indicated his burning desire to die for the holy faith. And she would be in the habit of saying to St. To Stephen on those occasions, My son and most faithful servant of the Lord, the time appointed by his infinite wisdom is drawing near. 
and thy hopes will not be frustrated. Do thou at present fulfill the rest of thy task in the Holy Church, so that thou mayest secure for thyself thy crown. Give thanks continually to the Lord, who has it in store for thee. Among the duties that St. Stephen had, and which he fulfilled faithfully in response to Our Lady's exhortation, was that of distributing alms and helping those in need. He was ordained a deacon by the apostles, and he was the principal one of those seven who were chosen for this task, as St. Luke records the matter in the Acts of the Apostles. And he, in fact, was the principal peacemaker between the Jews of Palestine and the Jews of Greece, when hard feelings turned the two groups against each other, and of which St. Luke also tells us. But though his charity towards those in need took up much of his time, St. Stephen did not cease to go before the Jewish leaders to defend the honor of Christ against them with great zeal and wisdom. The Jews saw that they could not withstand the words of wisdom and truth that came forth from this man who was so full of faith and of the Holy Spirit and so full of grace and power as we have already quoted St. Luke about him. And they finally gave up trying to murder him in secret. So then they resorted to the same tactic that they had used against Christ the Lord during his sacred passion. They accused St. Stephen of blasphemy against God which meant that he should be put to death by stoning. They also accused the saint of speaking against Moses and his law and against the Holy Temple of Jerusalem, as well as of, uh, asserting that Jesus of Nazareth would destroy both the law and the temple. With these charges against the saint, they finally brought him before the high priest while at the same time stirring up the people against him with their slanders, just as they had done against the Lord. From the standpoint of the enemies of St. Stephen, the high priest made the mistake of asking the saint if the charges were true, and of giving him time to defend himself. St. Stephen answered with the long discourse that is recorded in the seventh chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. With great wisdom, the saint proved to the assembled court that Jesus Christ was the true Messiah promised in the Scriptures. He ended up his discourse by very strongly accusing the Jews of unbelief and hardness of heart. He, the meek and peaceful saint so dear to Jesus and Mary, told the Jews that they were stiff-necked that they resisted the Holy Spirit of God, that they were the betrayers and murderers of Jesus, and that the law was entrusted to them, but they did not keep it nor live by it. The accusers of St. Stephen couldn't stand hearing any more from him, so they plugged up their ears and gnashed their teeth at him, but we will get back to this a little later. In the meantime, the Blessed Mother was fully informed by God of what was happening to St. Stephen. She sent one of her angels to the saint just before his last battle with the Jews, and she encouraged him for this final conflict. The saint sent word back to her by way of the angel that he was prepared to confess the Divine Master and to give his life for him. His only regret, he said, was that he had not been able to obtain from her her last blessing. So he now begged her to send her blessing to him and to assist him in the final hour. The Immaculate Heart of Mary was deeply moved by Stephen's words, and it was filled with even a greater love for him now. Our Lady desired to be with him in person, but she realized 
that it would be extremely difficult from the purely natural standpoint to reach St. Stephen under the circumstances. So she prostrated herself in prayer before God and manifested her desire to help her beloved disciple in his last hour, just as she was to do later on for another favorite of hers, St. James the Greater, in his last hour, and as is also recorded in detail in the mystical city of God. The Most High immediately granted the petition of the Blessed Mother, both because of his love for her and also because he desired to add new glory to the martyrdom of St. Stephen, who pleased him so much by his heroic virtues. The Almighty commanded that a multitude of angels from heaven should join the 1,000 guardian angels of Our Lady and carry her to St. Stephen. The angels at once placed their queen upon a bright cloud of heavenly splendor and glory and carried her to the court room of the high priest who was presiding over the fate of St. Stephen. But only the saints saw Our Lady and the angels, and he was inflamed with even a greater love for God and a greater zeal for his honor because of this extraordinary favor shown to him by the Most High. St. Luke tells us only how the face of St. Stephen shone like that of an angel as he stood before his enemies. The fact is that God willed that the brightness of Our Lady's heavenly glory should reflect upon the face of the saint so that the Jews could see at least some of the supernatural effects of Our Lady's presence, but without seeing her and without knowing the cause of what they were seeing. They were not worthy to see the full miracle that was happening in their very presence, but only enough to make them realize that a supernatural power was working with their victim whom they hated so much. Thus they could have no excuse for what they were doing to the saint. They could have no excuse for refusing to be converted. St. Luke did not record this miracle in all his details in his Acts of the Apostles. It was not the will of God that Our Lady's role in the martyrdom of St. Stephen should be made known at that time. Yet the Blessed Mother was there miraculously, and she spoke words of great consolation to the saint in his last hour, and she asked the Heavenly Father to fill him anew with the Holy Spirit, her prayer was heard by the Most High, who enabled St. Stephen to speak with such supernatural force and wisdom and courage to the leaders of the Jews. But there was a further miracle which is recorded by St. Luke, who tells us how the heavens opened up for St. Stephen, so that he saw up above the Divine Savior himself at the right hand of his Eternal Father, and this is what made him exclaim before the Jews, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But St. Luke does not mention the fact that it was because of Our Lady's intercession that this miracle happened. It was at this moment when the Jews heard those words of St. Stephen that they could stand it no longer and they therefore plugged up their ears and gnashed their teeth with the excuse that they were hearing words of blasphemy from the lips of the saint. That is how the wicked ones tried to cover up their own hatred and lack of faith by charging an innocent man with a horrible sin of blasphemy just as they had done to the divine Savior himself and then by decreeing that he should be stoned to death for that sin of which he was not guilty. They surrounded the saint like a pack of wolves and dragged him away to his death outside the city of Jerusalem. The Blessed Mother was not personally present for the stoning of St. Stephen, though God allowed her to see it all in a special vision. And as St. Stephen was dragged away by the Jews, Our Lady gave him the blessing for which he had asked through that first angel that was sent to him, 
not expecting that he would receive it in person from her. Only one angel accompanied the Blessed Mother back to the cynical, while the others were ordered by her to remain with St. Stephen until the end and then lead his soul to the throne of God in heaven. With her prayers, the Holy Virgin assisted the saint in his last moments, and she was overjoyed in seeing him so like to her divine son, even in asking forgiveness for his enemies and murderers. Though she was not in heaven for the glorious entry of St. Stephen, she saw it all in vision and she composed special hymns of praise to the Most High for all the graces given to St. Stephen. The angels of Our Lady came back to the cynical from heaven, and they thanked her for all the favors she had shown to the new saint and first martyr of the church. St. Stephen died about nine months after the passion and death of our Lord, and in fact, on the day that is equivalent to our December the 26th, the day on which the Church has always observed his feast. The day of his death also happened to be his own earthly birthday. He was born on the day after the birth of our Lord in Bethlehem. May the Lord bless you and give you peace.